This week's lecture is on diversity in culture and how it relates to curriculum. And really what we want to talk about are strategies to support the diverse learning needs of our learner population. So first we need to take a look at who our learners are and what that population looks like. So back uh, current demographics say that um, if you're in a baccalaureate program, 16% uh, of you are over the age of 30 and the rest are under the age of 30. If you're in an ADN program, 50% um, of the people are older than 30. And if you're in a diploma program, 33%. Why such diversity? So let's talk a little bit about those different programs and their approach to learning. Baccalaureate nursing program is usually a four-year program. Um, that program is usually a full-time program and is usually a face-to-face, -face, I have to go to school and uh, take a full curricular load. Whereas the um, ADN program is, is a program that is usually uh, accelerated in some way. Uh, usually that means it's year round, so the semesters run all together and you run through the summer so that people can get out of school faster. And generally that ADN curriculum um, is solely focused on the clinical uh, components necessary to be able to sit for uh, taking your RN licensure. Diploma program is very similar to an ADN program. There are very few diploma programs in place anymore. Why might um, why might a learner who is older than 30 prefer an ADN or a diploma program? Well, the obvious is because they can get it done faster. Generally, um, learners that are over the age of 30 have been out in the workforce with some other career, um, could be established um, with families, um, and, and their goals would be to get through this as fast as possible so they could sit for boards and then get into the workforce. The other thing that we need to look at is the components of nursing students. So if 16% of the students in the BSN group are over 30, that means, let's see if I can do the math, that means that at least, uh, you know, close to 79% of them or 73% of them are under the age of 30. So now we have differences in generational um, experience and that creates another disconnect that we need to think about in terms of curriculum. So if I'm a Gen Xer, um, I'm, I'm a work-life balance person, I'm a get it done and and make sure um, yeah, I'm, I'm an independent learner, if, if you will. If I'm uh, a Gen Y or a millennial, um, I've been used to this highly structured and planned life and um, I need a lot of feedback to keep me motivated and I, I grew up with technology so I'm expecting to see some of it here. Although I'll tell you that in nursing I don't find that we represent, nursing students represent the typical um, Gen Xer um, or millennial. I think that um, while uh, they utilize technology in terms of social media. They don't really utilize it in terms of their day-to-day -day lives, but that may be changing. Then you may have some Generation Z who are the people that are, you know, fully immersed. They've grown up with technology. Um, everything they do or want to do is interactive and experiential. So um, that 
poses a, an additional um, consideration when you're talking about who is my student population and what kinds of activities I might have to do. Um, and what if I have both of a Gen X and a Gen Z in the class, what kinds of um, barriers or issues might I come up with um, in order to uh, implement some of the things that I need to do. Um, for example, you know, so I, I start off each class with a Wordle. The reason I do that is I want to see comfort with um, technology. Um, I want to know who might need some additional help, particularly if we're going to be um, in an online learning situation. Um, and it's a really quick and simple activity that um, appeals to Gen Z's and Millennials because it's kind of cool and fun. Um, Gen X's generally tend to hate it and, and have difficulty um, getting the technology to work for one reason or another. Their computers are not updated to the latest um, software. I mean, it works, but it doesn't work with all the new bells and whistles of what goes on in technology today. Or they just aren't comfortable with the technology and it takes them longer. Um, so I do that activity one, so as an instructor I can see where do my students lie, and two, I can understand um, who I might have to give more detailed information to versus who I wouldn't. So demographic of your nursing students in terms of age, something you need to consider. Demographics in terms of racial and ethnic diversity of nursing students um, haven't changed a whole lot over the past 10 years, 20 years. Um, uh, the statistics I got from the NLN website um, and, the, and the latest they had were 2014. And we know that um, the NLN National League for Nursing is trying to um, has a whole diversity push and there are some additional documents in your um, additional resources that you can look at um, as to what they're doing to um, help uh, further the diversity of both the student population as well as the faculty population. But the bottom line is um, that the majority of our nursing students and nurses are white. Um, uh, we've made some gains in the area of trying to recruit from other um, races and ethnic diversity, um, but not a whole lot of difference when you're looking at this. Um, now, that said, this represents the entire United States, but I can tell you that this looks very different. Um, if I were to look at um, the statistics here at Cal State Long Beach, I think that um, I could easily tell you that our Asian or Pacific Islander population is um, equal to, if not more than our white population. Um, so, so I think that depending on your nursing school, you may get some differences in what that racial and ethnic diversity looks like. Now, I can also tell you that our faculty does not match the ethnicity of our, um, of our student population, and that has created some disconnects in some of our, um, expectations. So um, one one that I can think of off the top of my head is it's a very um, white American um, cultural activity to have um, discussions, group discussions, um, and that our expectation is that everyone will participate in those group discussions. Um, but when we have, um, we overlay that with the cultural 
uh, diversity of our Asian Pacific Islander group, um, that is not a cultural value to speak out in a group. In fact, in a group, um, you are expected to um, quietly observe. Um, you're not expected to uh, interrupt. And you're not um, that calling attention to yourself by stating something pr profound um, in that face-to-face -face situation, particularly if there are age differences among the group, is a really difficult thing. So, so in order to combat that, um, a way that you can do group work without having that face-to-face -face pressure where all of this comes through is you can um, utilize discussion boards. Um, and in discussion boards, it's, it's considered um, more acceptable to be able to post on your, on your information because it's considered to be a paper um, and it's not considered this face-to-face um, -face personal bragging um, thing, right? or, or at least as my students have described it to me, it, it's seen as bragging, particu particularly if there are age differences in the group. That's just a, a little tidbit from my experience. I'm sure you guys could offer many, many more um, ideas. Just so you get a sense of what our U.S. population and racial ethnicity is um, as of July 2018, 76% um, of the U.S. population is still white, 13.4% um, being black or African American, 18.3 Hispanic, 6.1 Asian Pacific Islander, and 1.3 American Indian. So you can see that our that our um, our nursing learners. I'll go back one slide. Um, still kind of mimic, for the most part, our patient population, but we all know that um, the Institute of Medicine put out, um, you know, what would it take to give better care way back, you know, I think 10, 15 years ago. And one of the main tenets of what they uh, think would make us more successful in meeting our patients' needs is to have a nursing workforce that um, mimics the racial ethnicity, uh, racial and ethnic um, diversity of our patient populations. And we know that this demographic that we're looking at does not look the same in every city and state across the United States. Um, so it, just something to keep in mind, all of these differences create um, barriers that we need to overcome and be aware of and talk about in order to deliver our best product, whether that be teaching nurses or whether that be taking care of our patients. Some additional considerations um, in our um, makeup of students um, is we have a growing LGBT, um, LGBT and that should say Q, um, population and and learning um, how to be more inclusive among our students and um, provide examples of patient care in these um, areas needs to be considered when we're creating curriculum. Um, we need to be aware of disabilities, whether that be the disabilities, learning disabilities of our students, um, or the disabilities that um, take place among our patients that we need to take into consideration when we're creating curriculum. Um, VETS is another uh, veterans, another class of um, nursing students here in California. Um, we pass some legislation that gives them um, preferred status into nursing programs, so we have had a larger influx. I don't know what our exact statistics are here at Cal State Long Beach, um, 
but we have had an increasingly larger influx of um, veterans into our nursing programs. Um, and they come with a set of um, life experiences and um, demographics that are different than the 19 or 20 year old student. Um, so again, a lot of diversity considerations that we need to take into place. And then um, particularly here at Cal State Long Beach, we have a um, more than our proportional share of first generation college students, which create um, a challenge for our ability to teach um, uh, because they don't have the same support systems um, in their homes as uh, what we would describe as the typical American experience. And um, therefore, we need to be more aware of how we can take that into account into our teaching. Um, uh, I know that a lot of times um, I will schedule a take-home test or just the fact that we're doing online classes. Um, uh, I will ask about computer status. I'll ask people to email me privately if they have some difficulty with computers because um, it's an assumption that everybody in today's world has a computer and a phone. Um, and it's not necessarily a true assumption. And um, trying to meet the needs of those students um, with resources that we have available is an important thing for us to take into consideration. I've literally had students that don't have computers, so I have to make alternative arrangements for them to take an online class that doesn't involve um, being at home. Some barriers that we know affect the success of these diverse learners is one, as we were just talking about, financial resources. So when you're talking about curriculum and you're talking about um, how you're going to um, deliver your material and you're looking at the, the resources that you're going to be using, be mindful of the cost of books. Um, one of the things that I do often is um, particularly, so publishers will um, generally uh, release a new book every three to four years. Uh, I will generally um, use uh, the third and the fourth edition, allowing the students a little bit of a break. And I will tailor my classes as such. I'll make a reading list for each book um, so that students can get a break in terms of um, cost of books, because cost of books is a big thing. I try to be very mindful of, um, there's wonderful programs out there, but at 200 bucks a student, um, if I'm going to use some sort of a simulation product, um, I'm going to look at how do I cut out a book. Um, and so uh, we need to think about that as we design curriculum. You have to use books as evidence-based practice to build your classes, but there are lots of options out there to get those ideas across um, and one might argue in a more current way than textbooks that are three to four years old before you even get them. Uh, so that's something to look at. Academic preparation. Um, we assume that everybody who gets into college is you know, at a certain level and what we find with some of our uh, diverse student populations is that academic preparation that we uh, assume to be there may or may not actually be there. And so we need to have uh, resources and scaffolds available to help students achieve um, at the level that we would like. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you um, 
in my day, the academic preparation for writing was higher than what I experience in terms of the learners that I work with today in undergraduate nursing. Now that has a lot to do with the language skills of the students where um, many of our nursing students here at Cal State Long Beach have English as a second language. So I have to alter my, I have to keep a standard of what I want them to aspire to, but I have to alter my expectation that everybody comes in writing at a, you know, a doctoral level or whatever my level is that I think it should be. So we need to take into consideration that language skills also impact academic preparation and um, our K through 12 schools are not um, set up or prepared to um, make a lot of the accommodations that they need to to help these students be successful. By the time they get to college we can make those changes. College is a voluntary thing and we should be um, helping our students to succeed and looking at how we can alter that practice. Now a lot of people don't believe, um, well we'll talk about it in terms of um, diversity with learning disabilities. Um, we have students who have learning disabilities that get to take double time to take a test and, and a lot of faculty are like well that's not fair in life they don't get double time. Um, you know, why do they get double time to, you know, be able to take a test? And what we know is that this is this is a reason this is a reasonable accommodation and this is one that we should um, should do in order to keep these students um, in order to be able to help these students succeed and and contribute because the value of their contribution is not just their RN licensure, as we've been talking about today in the very robust discussions on discussion board. The diversity and culture piece is really, really important, and we need to consider that um, we need that as much as we need the RN-ness uh, as we move forward. And then another barrier that affects uh, success is the disconnect um, between the faculty diversity and the student diversity, um, which creates barriers to mentoring and um, other additional things that we need to be aware of. So some of the strategies that improve success of diverse learners, um, we look for role models of, and mentoring, um, and that's why it's so important that the faculty uh, diversity matches the student diversity. Um, shared experiences make a richer learning environment. Um, we all know that. So, so that's one of the strategies that we can use to improve success is seek out a diverse faculty to match our student learner uh, population. We need to make sure that we have appropriate support systems in place, such as um, learning centers, student success co uh, counselors, um, uh, financial aid, um, the, the poverty, uh, the not the poverty, excuse me, the um, like food bank that we have on campus, so that students are supported in a way um, that allows them to be able to learn and be successful. Um, learning styles, you know, pros and cons to that, but they, they, people learn in different ways and it's important to understand and recognize that and to provide content in a varied way to help meet those needs. And then in nursing in particular, we have a big focus on cognitive skill development, which means um, we should be using a lot of problem-based learning, a lot of critiquing, um, was that the right way or is that not the right way? 
um, a lot of, hey, this is what you would do in general, but now if I tweak this and made it a little bit different, how would you change your approach? Um, looking at um, not having one right way, but having three equally right alternatives to choose from, why would you choose one over the other? Um, and last but not least, that whole reflection on action. What did I do? Was it successful? What would I do differently next time? And how am I going to be prepared to do that? So um, we spend a, a, a tremendous amount of time developing the, this cognitive skill development in, in nursing school. And, and we should be um, looking at ways that we can help scaffold people to be successful in these areas. Um, sometimes students don't come in with pro good problem solving skills. Things have been done for them. Um, the first semester of nursing school is always tumultuous because you have to do a certain amount of learning on your own. Um, you're now taking three courses at the same time that are equally hard where in order to get into nursing school you only took one. Um, so we're always trying to push the envelope with this cognitive skill development because that's what makes a good nurse. That we know that when you go out into the world, um, things are not black and white. In fact, they're varying shades of gray. And resources are not equal. Therefore, you have to think through things and understand why you would do something this way and not that way. Or, gee, I don't have that resource. Is there one that I could supplement there? Um, gee, my patient population doesn't look anything like what I learned in the books, but the core components of CHF are CHF. Now, how will I apply that to my cultural overlay of patients at my hospital. So as we begin to think of how we develop learning, and that's what curriculum is, is how am I going to structure the learning in order to provide a successful learning environment for my students? We're going to have to take all these things into consideration. So that's why we start out um, with the first assessment being a three, you know, a two to five page paper on your learner assessment. So you're going to tell me who your learners are, um, what are their cultural, what is their cultural background, um, what does that mean in terms of what you have to think about when you're going to put curriculum together. Um, I often say, you know, we have a, we have a two-year nursing program, but we have students who have life experiences and life issues that make a two-year program um, extremely difficult. And if they could take a, if we could identify the people that need it, and that need uh, a longer learning thing, like, you know, longer on a test. Well, how about longer to get out of nursing school? So instead of take, getting, taking one year or two years, it takes three or four. You can take one class at a time so that you can focus on what you need to do and be successful. Now, I know the alternative to that is, wow, you don't get to do that at the clinical bedside. The bedside you know, you have to be able to juggle what comes your way. Well, that's for acute hospital care nursing, but not necessarily for every um, area of nursing. So we have to quit thinking also that all of our nurses, when they graduate, are going to go work in hospital systems. Because, you know, I could argue that... that um, our health care of the future is going to be less acute care in the hospital and more out in the community than it currently looks like now. So, so how we structure our learning to help our learners be successful 
means that we have to actually look at our learners and understand their lives and understand the factors that influence them both in a positive and in a negative way. And we can do that in some sweeping generalizations. Um, so uh, the whole uh, program at Mount St. Mary's is geared to um, is geared to Mount St. Mary's University is geared to uh, women and geared to um, ethnically diverse women who can't necessarily go to school full time because they either have um, families that they need to get, take care of or they have to work in order to support themselves. So they've taken their curriculum and they have like four or five different models that you can use to get through nursing school and they've been very successful at it. So again, this is just one of the things that we look at as we put curriculum together and I want you to begin thinking more like what was wrong with your training that you would tr that you would change now because here's your opportunity to be more in tune with what you would need to be successful as you get out. So um, that said, that's the end of this week's lecture. Again, I want to compliment all of you. The discussion board this week has been very, very um, robust and interesting, and I appreciate your time and energy in 